Hey, it's Johnny Jet. Welcome back to my podcast and YouTube channel. And today we have Nicole Gustus, who has probably one of the most unique ways to travel internationally. I've never even heard it into, um, she told me on Twitter, she is an international cat sitter. This is true. International that, cat sitter. Yep. Uh, we've been doing it for about three years now. And um, in uh, so far, eight countries. Wow. Can you, which ones? Uh, Canada, United States, uh, France, Luxembourg, uh, Finland, England, Scotland. I consider Scotland a, a yeah, I do, separate I do country. Too. I do too. Yep. Uh, Australia, New Zealand. Wow. So how does one find a job like that or, or hobby or whatever you want to call it? Well, we found out about it. We were, uh, we had started out being a little nomadic. I moved to Thailand to work for a startup that that uh, did not succeed for a number of reasons. Uh, and we were traveling around Southeast Asia before our tickets to come back, myself and my partner. And we met someone in Chiang Mai who told us he didn't pay rent. And we were like, well, how does that work? And he said, well, I take care of other people's pets for them while they're away. And uh, so we found out about that and we were like, all right, well, let's learn a little bit more about that. And of course, like many people, when I first heard about it, it was like, oh, cool. This is a way to get a free place to stay. But now having done it for a while, it's much more like, oh, cool. I get to spend a lot of time with a really neat animal. You know, like the, the cats have actually become the primary driver mm -hmm. of why we do this. Because, so do you do dogs uh, too or just cats? We mostly stick to cats because I'm allergic to a lot of breeds of dogs. So it makes more sense to, uh, it makes more sense to stick to cats. Uh, we have also taken care of uh, birds, uh, sheep, chickens, um, which I guess fall under the category of birds and a couple of dogs. Fish? Hmm? How, about, how about fish? Yep, fish too. <laughs> oh my God. And can anyone, is there a way anyone can do this? Or I mean, do you just yep. have to or you don't want to At, reveal that because you don't want competition. Oh, I mean, I don't want the right now. I think especially there's um, there's a need because people still travel. Um, some people are still required to travel, and people need someone to take care of their pets. So there are several sites. There's a site called Trusted House Sitters. Um, there is a site called um, uh, for there's a lot of regional sites. So, for example, here in New Zealand, Kiwi House Sitters is the dominant platform in Australia. Aussie House Sitters is probably the dominant platform. Globally, the two dominant platforms are um, Trusted House Sitters, which started in the UK and um, tends to be is a little heavier in uh, countries where they speak English and Nomador, which started in France and tends to be a little more dominant in places where people speak French and also continental Europe. Well, and is there a minimum? I mean, you know, is it a month or two weeks or? Uh, some people, I have seen people post house sits for just one night um, and which, you know, uh, people do do. And I have seen people post house sits that are um, up to six months. And will they, uh, the pay, ones will that they are, pay for your travel or no? No, no, you, okay. it's your job to get yourself there. Um, but, um, and if you are, if you want to house it and you're willing to, well, I, I had someone say this house sitting thing. Okay, so I want to house it in London. I want to do it in September. And I'd rather do it in a place that doesn't have any pets because I have a lot of things that I'd like to do. And I said, yeah, okay. Well, that is just not going to happen. <laughs> um, you, um, if you're open to being in some more unusual places, we've house sat in places like Rennes, France, um, which is not a place that a lot of Americans go for as a tourist trip. And that's dumb because Rennes is amazing. Um, uh, we've sat in Espo, Finland. We've sat in a lot of small villages in England, which is fascinating because you get to see a whole different slice of British life than you do when you're staying at the tourist hotspots. So um, it's if you're open to stay in some more unusual locations, it opens up a lot more options for you. And do you speak other languages or? 
I speak terrible French that allows me to get by at the farmer's market and um, slightly better German. The irony being have never had a house sit in Germany. We were supposed to be house sitting in Germany all last summer, but COVID and that, as they say, was that. Uh, you were in New Zealand when COVID hit, which, I mean, you could not mm-hmm. have picked a better place in the world to be when COVID hit. Although yep. I mean, they just locked the borders down right away. So you couldn't even leave, correct? Uh, well, we could have, if our airline had kept flying, we could have gone because we were on American Airlines who canceled all their service to the US. And I found out through a Reuters article, not through them actually emailing me to tell me my flight was canceled. Um, things were really changing a lot back then, but we have close friends here who were just like, okay, well, stay with us during lockdown, not realizing we were going to basically be locked down for two months, but we all still like each other. So I think that's a, you know, that's a strong positive statement. So lockdown was two months. Uh, It was about two, we had what was called level four lockdown, which has only been done once where you can only go to the grocery store and the drugstore. And at the drugstore, you had to, you could go to the front door, tell them what you wanted, and they would bring it to you. And that was it. You were only allowed to go five kilometers from your home. You could go out to like take a walk and get a little exercise, but that was it. And then in level three, the joke is it's that, but with takeaway food. You could get uh, takeout food from restaurants, but you, um, everything else was really limited. And then, um, and we here in Auckland went back into level three last week for, uh, uh, because there were three cases found. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, that was just a three day circuit breaker so they could figure out where they had originated from and uh, make sure they tracked all the contacts so that they could uh, limit the spread of infection. So, I mean, but you can go out for a walk, but you can't, I mean, there's really nowhere to go except the grocery store you can go to? You can go out for a walk, I mean, There's plenty of places to go. The beaches here are are gorgeous, even in Auckland. You know, there's plenty of of great walks that you can do. You just can't go, like, you can't go to a shoe store. You can't go to the mall. You know, there's, uh, you can't go to places where um, uh, it, where it's indoor face-to-face contact. So you can go and pick up takeaway food, but you can't go to a restaurant. Um, Now, Um, everything's fine again. We're back to absolute normal. We went out to a restaurant in the movies last night. And it's full. I mean, are are, are movie theaters full? Well, I mean, it was, uh, it was a Thursday night and it was an art film. So it was not full. (laughs) But they could could be full if they wanted to be. Yeah. Yeah. They could be full if they wanted to be. The, um, the cinema options here are pretty limited because there aren't many films coming out of Hollywood. So it's, we're seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of art films and a lot of Chinese films, well, like art films and Chinese blockbusters. That's pretty much the, and, <laughs> and old movies. Those are the three big options. Okay. And are the Chinese blockbusters, are they dubbed or are they just uh, uh, subtitled? Subtitles. Subtitled. Uh, did get to see Nomadland. Totally recommend it. Fabulous film. <laughs> so, Where's the best place to catch it? Oh gosh, I don't. Um... And when and when you're cat sitting, can you go on excursions, or are you really just stay in? You you got to. I mean, you got to be there for the cat twice a day, or what? What is it? Well, it it depends on it depends on where you're house sitting. Um, we generally speaking, we um, we always talk to the homeowner first to find out uh how they want things handled so some cats like in new zealand most cats are outdoors so if you're if you're house sitting for a cat in new zealand the cat is you know you feed the cat in the morning and they're probably out and hanging out outside until the evening so you can definitely go out during the day like taking a three-day trip uh when you're house sitting that is not an option um so but like, for example, we've had house sits in Southampton, England, which was uh, offers a lot because that's a really good base from which to see places like Stonehenge and uh, uh, the New Forest. Um, a lot of other things that I think Stonehenge is the one thing that Americans really see, but um, uh, there's a lot of cathedrals down there. Um, it's just, um, it's a very great base to see the south of England from. So, um, and you might only do that in like four or six hour bursts, but uh, 
you have so much, if you're there for three weeks, you have so much more opportunity to go out. It's really more like living there than it is like being a tourist. I see. So it's, which is like the Airbnb thing, except you're taking care of a cat. So it really is like you're living there. So they just pay, you're just getting um, a room and board. I mean, you have to, you have to buy your own groceries, things like that, or. Yeah. Yeah. We, um, some people we've, we've house app for people who actually stock the fridge before we come, which is very nice of them. Mm -hmm. um, we've house app for other people where the fridge is totally empty, which is also nice because then we can fill it with our things um we um so we but we live in the place we take care of the cat and, and um in return we don't pay rent we don't pay for utilities or anything those are those are things that the homeowner pays as if they were still living there uh, because they're just on a vacation i mean they'd be paying rent either way you know right yeah i mean it sounds pretty amazing to be able to travel the world and, and not have to you know pay for a place to stay um, but it is work. I mean, it does sound like you are, it's not like do whatever you want. Yeah. Well, we have had a situation, we've had a couple of situations. We had a situation where, you know, we've, uh, I talked about Stonehenge. We had to cancel our trip to Stonehenge because we had to look after a sick pet. Um, and we eventually did get to go to Stonehenge. But at that point, it was, you know, two days of going to the vet and medication and uh and um everything worked out fine and she is still doing great because we're still in touch with many of the people who we've house sat for um uh, in fact i was just texting with one of them uh, about an hour ago okay. so like they've all a lot of them have become personal friends so um any places you're going to go next or well, that's a that's a, a good question. Right now, uh, we're renting a camper van to explore the Northland of New Zealand. Okay. Um, so all of the points north of Auckland. Um, Is that but, juicy, by the way? I, I think I read Juicy's going out of business, right? It, it is not juicy. Um, we are going with Brits because we wanted something with an actual toilet on board. What's it called? Uh, there's uh, Brits, B-R-I-T-Z. Okay. Um, there's a big, uh, this might be of interest, there's a big argument in New Zealand currently about what is called freedom camping. So freedom camping is you can basically pull over to the side of the road and camp in a lot of areas, or you can camp in a park or, you know, camp just by the side of the road. Um, there has been a concern uh, back when international tourists were still here that international tourists were um, pooping in wild areas. So like, you know, some of the most beautiful scenic areas ever. And then big pile of poo. Yeah, except that in fact was my reaction too. Uh, it is also awful when you see it. Um, however, uh, since the borders closed, um, lots of Kiwis traveled this summer. And um, what they discovered is that the amount of people pooping at, uh, at notable scenic places has not decreased. Not decreased. Uh, it has not decreased. Yes. Wow. So it's so, um, it, it appears that locals also do, you know, like a bear shit in the woods. Uh, pardon my language. Uh, <laughs> you can bleep that. Uh, they are, so the goal is to, um, there are a lot of campers for rent that don't have a toilet. And the goal is to, um, now that this is allowing a time for a tourism rethink, to get rid of all of those. So if you want to camp in, New Zealand using some sort of a camper, you need to have some sort of a, a toilet situation in there or uh, or you won't be able, won't, you will only be allowed to freedom camp if you have some sort of a toilet situation in there. I mean, there's definitely been some silver linings with this pandemic when it comes to travel because uh -huh. New Zealand was one of them. I mean, it was being over-traveled, right? I mean, they were talking about over-tourism. Yep, there are a lot of regions that are really happy uh, about um, how the tourism has uh, dropped back. You know, there's there's a lot of regions where they feel like they have some breathing room. Uh, there's a few regions like Queenstown is being hit very hard because Queenstown's focus was mostly international tourists and that's not really being replaced by domestic tourists. Other areas like Hawke's Bay had its best September ever. And uh, uh, you had a lot of people from Auckland traveling down there. Um, and it's a beautiful area. Like, why wouldn't you go to Hawke's Bay? Is Hawke's Bay the South Island? Scenery? North Island. It's North Island. Um, 
yeah, so it's it's an easy drive from Auckland. It's um, yeah, like five hours. I mean, okay. as someone who lived in California, it's an easy drive. Um, it's it's interesting that gets framed differently when you're in a country the size of Colorado. Um, what is considered an easy drive, um, but it's got beautiful scenery, great wine, um, you know, uh, lots of great outdoors things to do. So why you know why wouldn't you go to to Hawks Bay, um, South Island? Queenstown, um, Te Ana, which is the jumping off point for Doubtful Del Sound and Milford Sound, have been having some challenges. Stewart Island, Rakiura, which is the island south of the South Island, um, has actually been, uh, ha been so um, full up with tourism there. It's actually their best year in a very long time. So it's, the impacts are definitely not being felt equally here. So do you love New Zealand? Yes. Um, I was, uh, we were getting a little, um, there's just a gorgeous view everywhere. You can drop your camera and take a great picture, which is evident because I'm not a great photographer and I have taken some amazing photos here. Um, we were starting to get a little bit like, oh gosh, another scenic view, yawn. And then we went to the center of the island, uh, Ruhapehu and Tongariro, the volcanoes in the center of, of the North Island. And that's a very different environment. Um, there is a desert there, like a real legit, like California style desert, smaller, but you know, like, like think of the landscapes that you see heading out toward Palm Springs. And it's right. a little like that. Um, only, you know, with an active volcano in the middle. Um, and they've got this whole gondola system that takes you up toward the top of Rakiura. And I'm thinking, but this thing goes off every 10 years. So, which I think is, uh, uh, shows the optimism of the, the Kiwi psyche. You know, it's like, it's sure this could, this volcano could erupt and wipe out this multi-million dollar gondola system, but, in the meantime, this will allow a lot more people to see how gorgeous this natural area is. So, so did you why take not? It? Oh yeah, absolutely. And um, how long is that ride? It's uh, about two kilometers. I mean, in, in time, length, time. Um, <laughs> ten minutes, I think. Okay, it must be. A, so it'd be a rough ten minutes for me. Yeah, well, you're going over this volcanic landscape, and they've got monitors up there, so it's like it wasn't likely to erupt anytime imminently. Gotcha. Uh, there was a bit of a concern a month and a half ago because it seemed to be getting more active, but then it's it's calmed down. But the North Island of New Zealand is full of active volcanoes that go off every once in a while. And you get earthquakes pretty often in New Zealand. Oh, we spent two months in Christchurch over the winter. And I, I, lived, in L I lived in California for 12 years. I have experienced more earthquakes in the one year I've been in New Zealand than in the 12 years that I was in California. Okay. And Christchurch is a gorgeous city and out of everywhere is probably where I would choose to live in this country. Uh, no, no diss on any other area of New Zealand. But one of the things you have to get adjusted to is that you're gonna get an earthquake between a three and a four directly below you every probably four to six weeks. Every four to six weeks? And, you know, if it's a four, yeah. And if it's a four, everyone's like, yeah, it's just a four. Like there was a four in down in the Wellington area a couple of days ago. And I've talked to everyone and they're like, yeah, it was fine. You know, <laughs> nothing fell off the shelves. It's fine. Right. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I've been in New Zealand a couple of times. I love it. People mm -hmm. are amazing. I mean, honestly, mm -hmm. I think the people are the most amazing thing about New Zealand. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and the earthquakes, not so much. Fortunately, I did not experience one there, but I was in Tokyo one time and and I was on like the 20th floor and it was like a 5.4 and I was freaked out. It felt like it was a 10. Oh yeah. And I went downstairs, you know, and no one, not even one person flinched. It was just like business as usual. And they were looking yep. at me like, what are you doing in your underwear? Yep. And yep. It's, it's a whole different. And, and also here after the big Christchurch earthquakes 10 years ago, um, they've done a lot of work um, with earthquake reinforcement. Um, as a matter of fact, in Christchurch, I would say that the dominant architectural style is visible earthquake reinforcement. <laughs> like, like pretty much every building has big metal beams and sometimes they hang like beautiful things off them, but it's still like, congratulations, you are reinforced. You don't have to worry about earthquakes. Okay. 
but I, I actually feel more comfortable in a building like that than a really yeah. nice, good looking one. Yeah. Oh no, they they have managed to make it attractive. It's oh, really good. quite amazing. Oh, yeah. good. Um, yeah. So since you lived all around the world, where do you think the cheapest place to live is? Well, I think Southeast Asia is, is overall um, because the rents are cheap, the food is cheap, um, uh, traveling around is cheap, everything is cheap. Uh, and you can, like, if you're in Thailand, you can go to malls that beat anything in Beverly Hills to death. You know, the malls are in, in Bangkok are just stunning. Totally. Um, if you're in Europe, one of the things that really surprised us was how cheap France is. Um, uh, uh, maybe not Paris, right. but once you get out, pardon? Yeah, once you get outside the major cities. Yeah, like Rennes, Nantes, Strasbourg. Those are all places where um, rents aren't that expensive. Um, food is astoundingly cheap, um, uh, which was a big shock to me. Um, you can eat out pretty decently as well. And it's France. So even the cheap food is extraordinarily good. Um, uh, and um, public transit is also um, pretty cheap trains. I found to if you if you plan ahead, trains are also very cheap. I mean, granted, they're on strike every six weeks, but they usually have some minimal service running so you can work around it. Right. Um, uh, Finland was not cheap, but it was amazing. So it was, uh, it was definitely, uh, worthwhile. Um, uh, Luxembourg has enough money that they can make certain things cheap, like public transit is now free. Um, and there's a lot of things to do, like you can see Roman ruins and ruined castles and things like that, a lot of which are free. Um, so if you're a history buff or if you're a hiking buff or if you like cycling, um, uh, Luxembourg is a really good country for that. And it also makes a lot of uh, German wine country and um, uh, some French regions really, it's, it's a short drive. It's like where we were, it was five minutes to get into Germany and 10 minutes to get into France. Right. I've been to Luxembourg. It's beautiful. I mean, yeah, it's fortunately, amazing. I've been all the places you've mentioned, and I'm very fortunate, and I agree with you. I mean, yeah, the, the, the food in some of these places, and Southeast Asia, Thailand, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think it's the best, some of the best food. Actually, I love Singapore because it has Chinese, Malaysian, and, and Indian, and it's just so good. Yeah, I, I, love, I love Singapore too. Malaysia, we traveled around um, only Peninsular Malaysia, um, but it was um, really spectacular and it's very interesting because there are so many cultures being brought together there. So, uh, sorry, real quick about the uh, cat sitting. So when you do cat <laughs> sit, you know, on the first day, is it awkward? awkward? Do you, I, I assume you meet with the owners, they show you what to do mm -hmm. and, and do you spend the night when they're there or they just take off? It depends on the house sit. We have had house sits where we spend a day or even two days before they leave. Um, we have had house sits where we show up and the person has already left. Um, especially with a shy cat, it's easier if the owner is there for a little while because at least the cat gets to know like that the owner thinks that you're an okay person. Mm -hmm. um, we have had situations where um the cat that we're looking after it sort of ghosts us for the first couple of days like they eat their food and that's the only way you know they're there and then after a couple of days they warm up to us we've had other situations where um the moment we sit down the cat is in our laps so it's pretty uh, it's a pretty broad range of situations are they certain breeds that are friendlier than the others that you found I haven't found anything by breed. So I think it's really much more the way that uh, a cat was treated when they were a kitten really determines a lot of that. Um, also, one of our specialties is um, senior cats and special needs cats. So we've looked after um, blind cats, cats with epilepsy, deaf cats, cats with hyperthyroid, cats with arthritis, um, and a number of, of other issues. So we're used to um, feeding cats medication. Uh, one night we were trying to feed a cat its pill, seemed to take it, let it go. It spit out the pill, which stuck right there. 
because it was coated with cat saliva. So I wound up having a pill stuck to my forehead while we tried to once again get the cat to take his medication. That was a little complicated. And, and um, so you, you have to just be ready for moments like that. And so if you're having these sick cats, I mean, I assume that you might've had one that had kicked the bucket while you're watching them. Nope. Oh, good. Not yet. Not uh, good. And most of them, they're, they're not, they have manageable conditions that need to be managed by medication. Okay. So just like, just like elderly humans. I see. So, uh, so, and a lot of them are like, they have to get their pill twice a day, but they're pretty chill. There's a lot of cats who with the medication are totally chill about it. And then every once in a while, there is the one that's just like, like not happy about it at all. So. Is there any language barrier between the cats? If you're if you're in a country like France, where the owners, I would assume, speak French to the cat all mm -hmm. day, we have learned that for key the key things we need to any key commands we ask for um, commands. There's no commanding a cat; they're suggesting, um, but we always ask um, for the language and in fact in New Zealand there and Australia and the UK it's also things like intonation and accent okay so um, uh, we looked after a cat named Abby but because of the New Zealand vowel shift um, she was uh, her owner actually called her Ebby and she would not uh, respond to Abby she would only respond to Ebby interesting that's yeah well that's how it's pronounced so you um uh, telling a cat it's it's dinner rather than it's supper in order to get it to come, for example, you know, things. Uh, so, yeah, there is. A well, okay. certain, even, I, I must didn't ask that English, question. I'm glad I did because it does. Make yeah, even even in English language speaking countries, it's like same same language on the surface, but there's a lot of differences. As, gotcha. as we've learned here in New Zealand, there's a lot of there's a number of words that don't aren't quite what you think they are in the United States. Gotcha. So in case anyone wants to get in contact with you and, you know, hire you to become a pet sitter, where do they find you? I know you're on Twitter. Uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm Red Nikki on Twitter. Um, oh, we well, have a web how, how do you spell that? R-E-D-N-I-K-K-I. -K -K -I. Okay. Um, we also have a website called Cheapskate Nomad. And that just talks about that. That gives a bit of an overview on how to get into house sitting. Uh, if people really want to read up, there's a free magazine called House Sitters Magazine that is online that I, um, they do a spectacular job and I really recommend them to sort of get, figure out what this is, get more in depth on what this is all about. I see. Good. Well, listen, I, I, I really appreciate you sharing your insight and your experiences and taking the time. And I mean, I'm, I'm jealous that you're in New Zealand and what a place to be to be stuck when they um when the when the you know hit the wall hit the fan i feel so lucky to be here it's the irony is we were actually um one of the things we were disappointed about is we were like oh there's all these things we didn't get to see uh because we up until three days before our flight we thought we were leaving and uh and now we've gotten to see them all and are people wearing masks again in new zealand or no People are wearing masks on public transport, um, but aside from that, really not. Okay. Um, public transport, airplanes. Movies, um, when, you're, when you're watching a movie? No. Nope. No. Nope. I mean, there were three cases uh, and there's really the, the minimal community transmission that has happened off those three cases has all happened in relation to one high school. Um, so, and they've, uh, they've traced all the contacts. So it's all people who were contacts of the initial cases and they already have them quarantining. So, and are you using a, are you using a contact tracing app? So when you go to yep. the computer, do you scan your QR code? Yep. Uh, New Zealand has its own contact tracing app and they have done a really remarkable job of making sure to maintain people's privacy with it, which, um, for example, Singapore has a contact tracing app, but they're also sharing that information with the police, which makes people maybe less inclined to use it. Okay. Uh, whereas here they keep it, uh, that information is private. You get an alert on your phone if you have been to a place where someone who has turned up with COVID has COVID and it's an alert to go get tested. So. And is it mandatory to scan when you go to the movie theater or to the grocery store or restaurant? It, it is, 
I think it's one of those cases where it is so highly suggested that it is um, it, it is sort of socially mandatory. A couple of weeks ago, people were scanning less, but this last little blip has made people, I've noticed that people are much more likely to scan going in. We're religious about it, personally. Okay. And is there a cue to scan when you go into places or no? They put a lot of signs with the, with the QR code up and they also, have made, I, one of the things I've noticed over the past few weeks is they've made improvements to the app so that it grabs the QR code like that now. You just hold out your phone and a lot of times I'm not even locked in and it al already goes, bloop, you're, you know, you are a countdown. Gotcha. Well, I got so. one more question for you. Actually make sure. it two. Your best okay. tip, your best tip for visiting New Zealand and also your best tip about becoming a cat sitter or best advice. Yeah. Oh boy. Best tip about uh, best tip about visiting New Zealand. Um, Besides, don't pooping in the woods. Uh, don't poop in the woods. That's a big one. Um, don't sleep on the South Island. I think only twenty percent of people who come to New Zealand, maybe thirty percent, go to the South Island. Do you say the don't South sleep Island, on the South Island? As in, like, don't don't ignore it. Um, okay, people gotcha. often will come to New Zealand, tour around the North Island and be like, oh darn, I ran out of time. Um, the South Island has phenomenal scenery and it has phenomenal scenery in, in an entirely different way than the North Island. That's, that's most people's favorite parts of New Zealand is the South mm -hmm. Island. It's a, it's a spectacular area. And if you can get into places like um, Delphal Sound, um, Rakiura, um, Rakiura, Stewart Island in particular, you'll get to see a lot of nature and wildlife that you don't get to see easily in the rest of the uh, uh, in the rest of the country. For example, walking home from bar a bar on Stewart Island at ten o'clock at night, you are very likely to trip over a kiwi. Um, they just trip they're just what? a kiwi. A kiwi. Okay. Yeah, they're just kind of running around doing I their see. thing. Yeah, they don't they're, fly. Kiwis don't fly. Right, exactly. Hence the tripping part, um, which has apparently literally happened. The uh, the kiwis are a lot less skittish there. I see. Um, they um, they're a, a separate breed, and there's all kinds of stuff about them that I could go into, but it's nerdy, and gotcha. you don't want to hear it. Uh, but that and a lot of other a lot of other creatures, the uh, various parrots like the kaka and stuff like that, you can see there. Okay. So. Um, yeah, the, the more remote you get on the South Island, the more interesting it gets. Good to hear. And how about your best advice for becoming a cat sitter, international cat sitter? Ooh, um, start, uh, if you want to build a profile, start by sitting in your own area because that's an easy way to build up a couple of reviews before you go on, before you decide to go on the larger international stage and be open to unique uh, smaller destinations. We have, we started out sitting in those places because we couldn't necessarily get that sit in London or that sit in Manhattan, we still have never gotten. Um, but as we've been doing it, we've actually found that going to those places that are a little off the beaten path, we get to see things that Americans aren't familiar with that are just mind-blowingly amazing. Awesome. That's great advice. Thank you again for taking the time. I see that my battery's running low. I got to run upstairs right. and plug it in because I didn't think it was going to be this long, but you're so interesting. Oh, so, well, thank you. Very so thank you for taking the time and uh, we'll, uh, we'll be in touch. All right. Great. Thank you. Take care. Um, yep. You too. Uh, before you end this like non-interview thing, I think that uh, Nomador will